Um, let me do this. In verse 3, he's speaking to the church at Ephesus, which we assume then is the same church that Paul addressed the letter to the Ephesians there after the book of Galatians. And um, one thing that if you turn very quickly over to Ephesians chapter 1, and Ephesians has so much in it. So much in it. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, letter that Paul wrote. But um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul talks about, uh, he gives one of the aspects of salvation. He says in verse 10, in the dispensation of the fullness of times. In other words, Christ came at exactly the right time that God wanted him to come. It was the fullness of times. When Jesus comes again, it's going to be the fullness of times. Paul wrote and he said, uh, "Be not beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So it, to me, it looks like God's going to be done saving the Gentiles. He's going to shut the door on them. He's going to put them in darkness. Those who, will, those who are not saved as of that point are, I won't say out of luck because it's not luck. They're out of blessings, out of grace. Then he's going to turn the door around, open it up to Israel. But he's, he says here in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Predestination has to do with God's foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the outcome of your life. He knows, God already knows whether you're going to make it or not. He already knows it. So when God proves things, like the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, when God tries us, it is for our benefit and for everybody else's. It is to show this person really wasn't who they said they were. They said they were a Christian. But I'm going to show you they're not. And so he allows trials to come along. And the trial then proves whether or not he is born again or not. God already knows the answer to that. So that's what predestination is based on. God's foreknowledge. Then he said in verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory. Who first trusted in Christ. In whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I believe that God seals his saints like Tupperware or better. Why do you put stuff in Tupperware? To keep it. To keep it, to keep spoilage away from it, to preserve it. That's the purpose of it. We see in Revelation 7 that the tribes of Israel are going to receive the seal of God in their foreheads. God is literally going to seal them with that Holy Spirit of promise. Um, he says, uh, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, God is giving us, since he's given us a belief in his word, which is the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. Promises are in the Bible Therefore, when God seals us, he seals us according to his word and along with his word. There's nobody who says, I'm saved, but I don't believe the Bible. Well, they might say that, but they're liars. It's one or the other. If you're saved, you're going to believe the Bible. If you believe the Bible, you're saved. So he says, it's the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So God seals his saints. God has by foreknowledge his knowledge of how they're going to turn out. 
how all the decisions they make are going to turn out, what decisions they're going to make, what what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. God already knows all of that. Okay? So now, Paul, uh, Jesus writes to the church at Ephesus in verse 3, has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. And we discussed that a little bit last Sunday. I want you to turn to, oh, let's see here. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Who remembers the worst whipping you ever got from your parents? Cubby. I met Cubby's mom at Walmart. Just fell in love with her instantly. I said, ma'am, I sure do love your son. I said, I think you did a good job with him. You must have whipped him exactly the right amount of times. She kind of thought that was funny. I can remember a couple whippings that I got. The worst one I got was the one I had to wait all day on. What was that over, sis? Burning the tree house down. My little buddy that lived down the road, we were up in his tree house in his backyard playing with matches. Burn his tree house down. Fire department had to come, hose it down. Mom was in town here helping. This is back in the day when parents could leave their kids home all day by themselves. Until, until that day. And then she didn't do that no more. But Melissa called the people that she was helping here in town and told what happened. And my mom got me on the phone. She said, son, I want you to go to your room. And I want you to shut the door and I want you to pray. Because when I get home, I'm going to kill you. And I had to wait all day long for that whipping. And it was not a gentle, I feel sorry for you whipping. It was a, I'm going to beat you so bad, you will never do this ever, ever again. And I didn't. Never burnt his tree house down ever again. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, and God changed my message again this morning. That's like three Sundays in a row. I had the message planned out on the way over here. God put something in me. So when I got here, I put together a message. And it has to do with this. We're not entering in to better days. Not right now, we're not. We are entering into dangerous days. Troublesome days. Days that I don't want to go through. We're going to, we're, all of us are going to be like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Praying, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let not my will, but thine be done. Those days are coming because it's not getting better. The Sodomites are not recognizing how right we are. And everybody else, even if they're not sodomites, they're not going to give up. Do you think, do you think that next year Missouri will vote to make it illegal to take medical marijuana? Do you think that'll happen next year? No, once we've let that cat out of the bag, we're not getting that cat stuffed back in. It's not, it's not going to happen. The purpose of getting medical marijuana approved in a state is to get the people 
loving and enjoying marijuana so that they will then legalize it for at any purpose. Okay? That's the purpose of it. Nobody ever turns back from sins like that. They never go backwards as far as that's concerned. We are entering into dangerous, perilous times. Pernicious, very deadly times. And we are going to be surrounded by people who hate us. Not because we've done damage to them, not because we've hurt them, but because of what we believe. And the purpose of that is God uses that mechanism to sort out who is and who isn't. That's, what he, that's how he uses it. Jesus is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And it's not going to be an easy time. The Bible says we will be sifted as wheat. Rubbing off the chaff, getting rid of the impulses and desires of the flesh, that's the chaff, to remove that out of our life. But it's a very rough process. But is it necessary? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, he says, verse, um, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't quit. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In other words, no one spilled your blood yet. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you are a son of God, a child of God, and you get out of line, God uses his loving rod to bring you back in line. Remember what David said about God's rod. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Okay? So the purpose of God chastising us is to show us how much he loves us. Because if he did love us, he would just let us go. Do her own thing. So he says, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. A rebellious child, a teenager, would say to their parents when their parents are getting on to them, shut up, I don't want to hear it. I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of you telling me what to do all the time. I can't wait till I get out of this house and I don't have anybody tell me what to do anymore. Is that true? Oh no, it gets worse. Because even though your parents get, a, get you know, chasing you, um, have to take things away from you, rebuke you, yell at you, scream at you, make you do things you don't want to do, they're still going to feed you. You're still going to get to live in their house, eating their groceries, wearing their clothes. You're still going to get to do all of that. You get out on your own and your boss doesn't like the job you're doing and he yells at you and you say, I don't have to put up with this. Fine, you don't have to put up with that. You can leave and go home and not earn any money and lose your house, lose your food. He says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And is that a curse word? Yes. It's a curse word. If I were to say that word when I was eight, I'd have got a mouthful of ivory soap. But it is a curse word. 
If you refuse God's loving chastening, God says you are not, and a bastard is someone who doesn't receive the inheritance. They don't get written in the will. No heaven, no everlasting life, nothing. And you have to ask the question, which would you rather have? Would you rather have God's chastening his, and his loving chastening on you and escape hell or forbear God's chastening and receive hell, which is better? The chastening, the beating. To receive that is better because chastening is temporary. Unless you were our mother. And then it went on for hours. No, not that long. But there were beatings I got that I wish she would have stopped. And she didn't stop. But I needed it. I had it coming. I deserved it. And it hurt. I can never forget Mr. Moutre. Remember him? Mr. Moutre was fat, so we called him Mr. Moo Cow, but not to his face. And Mr. Moutre was the elementary school principal at Festus. And the very first whipping I got in public school, that was back when they did this, was when I was in fifth grade, Mr. Gary Brown's fifth grade class. And by the way, we were great friends. He's a teacher that we wrote back and forth for years after I got out of his class in fifth grade. He really liked me. He was a Christian. He knew I was a Christian. But he gave me my very first paddling at school. And I didn't know what to expect. And he took me down to Mr. Moutre's office, told Mr. Moutre what I had done. Mr. Moutre said, let him have it. So he bent me over the desk and I'm facing Mr. Moutre and he pulled back with that paddle and that, and the wood was about that thick and he let go on me on my backside and my eyes, and I did, I went <gasps> like that and I could see on Mr. Moutre's, uh, Mr. Moutre's face, he went like, did it hurt that bad? Yes, it hurt that bad. It's the awfulest whipping I ever got in my life. But you know, that man loved me. That teacher loved me. Because like I said, we carried on. He moved down to Texas after that. We carried on a letter writing. He was my pen pal for years. And even when I got into college, I had a chance to visit Houston. You know, there's only 20 Gary Browns in the Houston phone book. And I called every one of them until I found the right one. And he was still there. And he and I spent the day at NASA just palling around together. He never forgot me. I never forgot him to this day. That man cared about me. And he knew I couldn't shut my mouth. And he said, this young boy needs help. And he gave it to me. And I didn't despise him for that afterwards. Because I knew he cared about me and I cared about him. Okay? That's the kind of stuff that will happen in your life. So when you are chastened by God, don't despise it. And I'll even say this, if you're being chastened by the devil, don't get upset either. God allowed it to happen. You're, and Peter said it's better to be chastened for righteousness sake than it is for unrighteousness sake. For unrighteousness sake, you deserved it. But because you were living right, it's almost like it's a crown of honor when the devil scourges you, when the devil chastens you, when the devil sifts you as wheat. It's almost like a badge of honor to wear. Because Peter and John, you remember when they got beat up by the Sanhedrin and told never to preach in Jesus' name again? They left that meeting glorifying God that they had been counted worthy to receive persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ. After all, Jesus did, did he not? Amen? Now, Revelation chapter 2. 
verse 4. Jesus is going to address something here that I think is all too familiar with every one of us. If you remember the day that you got saved, remember the day that Jesus opened your eyes. Remember the day that for the first time, true joy filled your soul. And what a blessing that was. And you were in love with Jesus. You loved God. And you may have said in your enthusiasm, I will never, I will never turn my back on God ever again. I, the way I feel now, I'm going to continue to feel this way for the rest of my life. And did that happen? No. So look what he says. Revelation 2 verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Jesus has to correct his church. He can't just say all nice, smooth things. He can't keep saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jesus has something against this church. And he said, because thou hast left thy first love. When you got saved, you loved Jesus. And you were thankful. You may have been crying out of joy that God would reach down into the pit that you were in pull you out, clean you up, wash you, make you whole, relieve the burden of the guilt of sin off of your life. And now you're just like, man, I, this is the greatest thing in the world. I want to tell the world about Jesus. And maybe for the first week you're on fire. Some people don't even last that long. Some people get saved one day and the next day the devil pours out hell on them. To try to talk him out of it. Now if it's fake. He eventually will. But if it's real. He never will. But all of us. Have been guilty. Of losing. Our first. Love. It's like a marriage. You fall in love. You get married. Everything's great for a while, the honeymoon. But then life happens. She gets mad at you. You get mad at her. You get mad at him, whatever. And you don't feel quite the same as you did when you first met, when you first got married, when you, the first year. You lose that first love. So he says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Is it possible for a Christian to stumble? To fall? Did not the Bible say a just man falleth seven times? And riseth up again? Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and do what? Repent. Repent means I see myself going down this road again that I don't want to go down anymore. And I don't want to be here. Repent. Come back out of that. And then he said, and do the first works. Where you fell in love with Jesus. Where you wanted to tell the world about him. Where you couldn't hold in the joy and the rapture that you felt. And you just wanted everybody to know about Jesus. And you were convinced that if everybody would just hear your story, they would fall in love with him too. Doesn't work that way. And he said this. Uh, Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now that is a serious warning. The candlestick, there were seven. 
Jesus was in the midst of those seven candlesticks. And he said, this, the candlesticks are the seven churches. So he said, unless you repent, I'm going to take that candlestick out. And you're not part of the church. I'll replace you with somebody that I can work with. God dealt with me one day, multiple times, but one day in particular. It's right after I became pastor here and young and arrogant and full of myself. And we had a Sunday Easter service and I left my office, headed to the restroom and I walked by the little attendance board out here. And it read something like 125 for Sunday worship. And I looked at that coming out. And I walked in the sanctuary, pat myself on the back, saying, I must be doing a good job. And God, the Holy Ghost, grabbed me by the collar and put me down at that altar right there. And I started bawling my eyes out. And God said, Mike... I'm the one who brings people in this church or I take them out. You don't. Now, I want to work with you. But if you're going to take all the credit and you want me to stay out of it, I will. But I will take you out of this place and I will put somebody in that I can work with. Now, which is it? And I mean, God was, I mean, he had me in tears. Because not too long before that, I had spent quite a bit of time with God, bawling, crying, repenting, begging God to never take me away from this place. Never. And God said, Mike, I'll do that. I'll keep you here. As long as you realize that it's my church. I'm the boss, I'm the head, you're not. And if you can go along with those terms, I'll work with you. But if you can't, I will take you out. And I will put somebody in here that will. And that scared me. And I repented to God. I said, God, I will never again take credit for those who come in this place. That will be you. So David said. Psalm 51. Turn there. Psalm 51 is. Does anybody know. Why David wrote that particular psalm. Gary. It's because he. When he. When he. Uh, saw Bathsheba. And he killed Uriah. Yeah. It was, but he didn't do it immediately. He didn't repent immediately. He repented after Nathan the prophet came to him. And um, David then repented. But it shows you David's heart. Notice this. And this, this goes along with the Ephesians church losing their first love. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. And notice the word renew. Meaning it was new once. And I want it to be new again. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. That's the same as I'll take your candlestick out. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why do you think David said that? Because he knew what God did to Saul. The Bible plainly says, and it's in no uncertain terms, that God removed his spirit from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord came over to Saul. David knew it. Saul knew it, which is why Saul now is not hearing from God, either by prophet 
or by vision or by Urim and Thummim. God's not saying a word to him. So that's why he has to go to the witch at Endor, who has a familiar spirit, and hear from a devil. He put his trust in a devil spirit because God pulled his Holy Spirit away from Saul. And he says, I'm not talking to Saul ever again. He's not getting nothing from me. And again, I say to those who still believe that that was Samuel that came up back from the dead, God said that he wasn't going to speak to Saul ever again through prophet. It couldn't have been Samuel. It wasn't Samuel. So David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore. Restore. It means it was stored. The store is depleted, and now it needs to be restored. Restore. You should have seen Costco yesterday when they brought out new pallets of toilet paper. We got one, by the way. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That, that, by the way, that's, that's one of the reasons why God lets you go through that. Where you had that first love, you lost it, God chastened you, brought you back, restored his Holy Spirit to you, restored the joy of His salvation to you, and you've been through that experience, and you can recognize it in other people. And maybe if you're friends with them and they trust you, you can go to them, put your arm around them and say, look, I don't know everything that's going on in your life, but I recognize some things that I went through. Can I pray with you? Can I help you get back the joy that you once had in your life? That's what he said by, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's why God lets you go through that, so you can be a, a help and a blessing to others. Isaiah 54, verse 6. Turn there, very quickly. Bell's going to ring. Isaiah 54, verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, who, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. You see, Jesus made was making an offer to the church at Ephesus, saying to them, I'm glad you're doing this, I'm glad you're turning away from the false apostles, but I have somewhat against you. You've left your first love. Repent, do the first works, and I'll be kind to you. I'll be loving to you. I'll be merciful to you. But if you don't do that, I will have no choice but to take your candlestick out, replace it with somebody else. Um, very quickly, number 14, God said... To Israel, in verse 12, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. That's scary. God's written you in His testament. But you turned your back. You brought shame to your heavenly Father. And God said, if you don't, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to disinherit you. Um... Judas, was he numbered among the twelve? Sure he was. And yet, Acts chapter 1 verse 20, it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, or his office, let another take. And he's quoting from Psalm 109 verses 2 through 10. He says, let his, verse 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. God took Judas out and replaced him with somebody else who would be faithful to Jesus Christ. His name was Matthias. Nobody. That's one of the seven spirits of God, the, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Is that you realize that 
you're not so valuable to God that he can't afford to lose you. So he's just going to put up with whatever you do. God can take you out and replace you with somebody that he can trust. Don't ever forget that. That's called the fear of the Lord. I know how good God's been to me. But I also know that anything that I am right this minute, I don't deserve any of it. I don't deserve it. And God has brought me to the point at one time in my life where I was afraid that God was going to take my candle out. I don't want that. Stop and think about hell for a minute. In fact, close your eyes. Bow your head, close your eyes. Just for about 10, 15 seconds, picture yourself with God saying, Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. That scares me. And it should scare you too. Father, we love the fact, God, that we are sealed by your Holy Spirit of promise. But Father, we know also that in sealing us, you give us a spirit of perseverance. People that will continue on. And it's not going to be easy. And the devil has many tricks up his sleeve to try to talk us out of serving you. And Father, I do believe that since COVID struck our church, that there are some that could be dangerously close to the devil just talking them out and saying, you don't need to go back. God, let it not be. Father, I pray for my own family. I pray, Lord, for the people who used to go to this church. And I pray, dear God, that your love and your mercy and, if need be, the chastening rod would drive them back to the house of the Lord. Help us, dear God, to stop using excuses. Stop making up lies that we ourselves believe as to why we don't serve God anymore. And help us, dear God, to get our hearts back right where they need to be. Because I don't want it said of me or any of my people. I have somewhat against thee, saith the Lord. God, please help those who are weak today. Restore unto them the joy of your salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.